Good morning, everybody. Good to see you guys. Happy Labor Day. It's a beautiful, rainy Labor Day for us all, right? Uh, everybody's excited. Hey, I, I'm Dan. It's good to meet you. If you're new here, I would love to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, please stop by the Welcome Center and let us know you're here. They've got a free uh, gift for you waiting on you there. If you're worshiping with us online, all of you people that are traveling for Labor Day weekend, I hope you have a good time out there and glad that we can connect with you this way. Uh, and if you're uh, visiting with us online for the first time, uh, uh, we've heard some really cool stories over the last year and a half with COVID and stuff like that, people uh, actually visiting and then getting connected to the church church. And so we're really glad that uh, we're able to connect with you as well. And if you are new, let us know that. Uh, there's a place right there uh, online. You can connect with us and drop a message in the chat. Uh, if you're on Facebook or something like that, we would love to connect with you. We're in the middle of a series called The Table. We're following uh, this theme, uh, motif through the Gospel of Luke uh, that uh, he really drills down into. And it's almost like a, a thread that he weaves back and forth through the story of Jesus. He doesn't just tell about about the story of Jesus, he displays it, and he displays it around the table. Uh, we started our first week by talking about the fact that everybody has a seat at the table, that Jesus' gospel, his kingdom, is creating a table that's bigger. Uh, it's people that from different backgrounds, different uh, skin colors, different places, and bringing them all to the table uh, around the person of Jesus, and that Jesus welcomes those that are far from him, the people that are broken, sinful, which is all of us, and he welcomes us to this table. And what we want to know, uh, everybody to know from the outset, is that uh, you have a seat at the table within Jesus' kingdom. And you may not have ever considered that. You may have thought that church was only for those people or certain people. But Jesus knocks down the walls, sends out the invitations, and brings everybody to the table. Last week, we talked about the fact that Jesus is the head of the table, uh, that there's a, a lot of different ways that we approach the table, per se, when we, uh, we mistake uh, different things or people for being the head of the table. But uh, we looked at the story of the woman that anointed Jesus' feet uh, at the, the Pharisee's house and how uh, she blew past all the common and cultural conventions and she came to Jesus and she recognized Jesus as the head of the table. Uh, and all those things are pivotal. And, and if you haven't uh, listened to those messages, I highly encourage you to go back, not because I'm the one talking about them, because God's word is really good. Uh, and uh, there's some really awesome things. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, serving the table, uh, serving the table. In, in your seat, you should have when you came in a, a little note card, a little index card and a pen. Uh, and so if you would right now, I want to ask you to do an exercise if you're willing. If you'll take that card out and you'll take that pen out, uh, and if you're at home, you're going to just kind of have to, uh, you can text it, I guess. You can write it in your phone or, or something of that nature or open up a window in your computer. But all I want you to do uh, is really easy. Uh, just write your name. Just write your name on that card. Uh, just jot it down. And, and as, as I'm talking, hopefully it won't take you too long. And uh, we'll get back around that to the end uh, of the message today. But just write your name uh, on that card really quick. Now, when we think about the table, I, I don't know about you, but uh, there's a lot of different things that I think about. Uh, one of the most uh, ready things to draw from is uh, maybe your favorite restaurant. You go to a restaurant, uh, obviously there's a lot uh, of tables there. Now they're a little bit more spread out than they used to be, uh, but uh, you go in there and there's just a slew of tables. Uh, and uh, man, uh, my family, uh, when we go on vacation or something like that, our favorite thing to do really is to eat. We like to pick out restaurants and we like to just enjoy that. Um, I mean, if we could eat out every night, we probably would if we could afford it, but we don't. Uh, but we love going to restaurants and uh, uh, love a good meal, love, uh, you know, honestly, I, I love being served when I go there. I love not having to uh, get everything ready to cook it. I like to not have to clean up uh, after we're finished. I like leaving it all on the table, leaving a tip and walking out and going about the evening. Anybody with me? Y'all like that. And it feels good, right? Uh, and especially the, the longer you go and the more kids you have, the more you appreciate those opportunities uh, if you can blow past that bill uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the evening. But, you know, here's the funny thing about that is uh, a lot of times those, those type of impressions uh, are culturally conditioning us to approach a lot of different things in the way we would approach our favorite restaurant. Uh, many times, I think, within the modern day, uh, and I don't really know what modern day is, I don't know when this happened. I don't know 
itself is just a common uh, human characteristic, and it's always been this way, but it seems like it's becoming a, a growing uh, facet of, uh, of our society when it comes to church or communities of faith, where we treat communities of faith like we do our favorite restaurant. Uh, you know, you come in and uh, you know, you'll come in there for the, uh, for the appetizer and maybe the appetizer is just kind of the hospitality or our guest services team out there in the foyer. Uh, you come in and you kind of sit down and you begin to eat the chips and salsa. I, my favorite places to go is places where I can have, uh, you know, that appetizer, chips and salsa. So I'm eating and halfway full by the time the, the food gets there. Uh, and, and you come in, you know, you kind of, you take in the, the music and all those type of things. And then you get to the main course. I'm calling it the main course. Uh, the message, you know, uh, and uh, you, you do that. And if you don't like the main course next time, you think, well, I hope that they have somebody else to bring a different main course next time. And uh, you pick a different main course uh, the next time you come through. And then at the end, maybe you leave a tip on the way out. You know, you throw it in a box or something that line, uh, along those lines. And a lot of us, we approach communities of faith that way. And I, I, I'll say this, I will say this, that on some level, all of us are on a journey from becoming a consumer to becoming a contributor. Uh, where we come into a community of faith and we all start as consumers. And if you're here today, first time, or you've been trying things out, or you're trying to get your feet under you, it's perfectly reasonable and understandable that you would start out as a consumer. As a matter of fact, uh, a lot of what we do around here is with you in mind. I mean, if you were to come, much like a restaurant, we want you to have a really good experience. We want you to feel welcome. Uh, we want you to come back. We want you to enjoy your time here. Uh, we would want you to tell your friends like you would a good restaurant, like, hey, that's a place I would love to go. And so on some level, we're all consumers, but the journey of faith is actually moving from uh, a consumer unilaterally to becoming a contributor. And we're all on that faith journey. That's a part of what it means to be a community, part of a community of faith. And so if you think about the church and if you think about God's table, you think about the kingdom of God, it really is the process of moving from consumer to contributor to just taking in and enjoying and to actually participating. And so I think uh, that actually when you look at a community of faith or the church or what God wants to do in your life, it's a lot more like a uh, potluck than it is uh, going to your favorite restaurant. I can remember uh, growing up uh, in and out of church different times. And one of the uh, kind of the uh, uh, bedrocks, it seemed, of the church that I grew up with were these things called potlucks. Anybody remember potlucks? All right. Uh, that doesn't happen a lot, especially during COVID and bring COVID up a lot. But uh, nobody really wants to eat somebody else's food right now for some reason. Uh, but I can remember just those times of everybody bringing something to the table. And uh, when I pastored a church, a little small church, uh, just up the road in Mark Tree for several years, and uh, we would have a monthly business meeting. And, and to make the monthly business meeting palatable, you know what we did? We attached a potluck to it. Uh, because nobody's coming to the business meeting, but everybody wanted to come and eat the food. And uh, the thing about the potluck was, is everybody kind of had their thing. Uh, we had certain people that always brought the same thing every month to the potluck, and they became known for that. So it was Miss Dorothy's fried chicken, or it was Miss Patsy's banana pudding. And uh, we all looked expectantly to what individuals were going to bring to the potluck. And uh, everybody had something to bring. As a matter of fact, uh, this is something my mom taught me early on, uh, and I have been reminded of it and to, to the young people in here. No offense, but I want to introduce you to a question that you can ask when somebody invites you over or you go to a potluck, and it's simply this question, what can I bring? Okay. Uh, it seems like that's not a, like a thing that's in the vernacular today. It's like, what can I bring? Uh, but the potluck is built around this idea that I have something to bring and that you have something to bring. And when we come together, we're able to share a meal together, but it's contingent upon the fact that if you don't bring anything and I don't bring anything, then there is nothing to feast around. There is nothing for us to partake of. And there's something about a community of faith. There's something about us coming together that is built around the idea, not as the church being your favorite restaurant, and that you can compare and try out different restaurants and go to this one there and then that one there, but it's about actually bringing what you have to the table. And much like we said that everybody has a seat at the table, I want you to know today is that everyone has something to bring to the table, and that means you. 
So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at a a famous story. Uh, and we're going to kind of try to get around the context of the story a little bit and get into uh, the scenery of the story to feel what the disciples and Jesus perhaps felt. And hopefully by the end of this, we can answer the question, what can I bring? Uh, let me introduce you to the story and the players in the game. It's in Luke chapter 9. We're going to begin in verse 10 today. It's uh, famously called the feeding of the 5,000. This is a famous story in that uh, there are some stories within the Gospels that are only shared in one or two Gospels. This is one that through the Synoptic Gospels, as a matter of fact, all the Gospels share a story quite like this. And so we're going to uh, see why the Gospel writers thought this was an important story to us, for us to know about as it pertains to us serving God the table. Let's pick up in verse 10 and we'll work our way way down through it. This is what it says. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Now, typically when we read the story, at least me, maybe you're different, but when we read the story of the feeding of the 5,000, this is a famous story, like I said, we don't typically stop and realize what's going on. Like what, what's been happening? And a lot has transpired up until this famous feeding of the 5,000 moment. Uh, and, and, and so I think it's really important for us to uh, understand what these people were feeling, what these disciples were feeling, because they had just come back from somewhere and they had just done some things. And so my question, if I'm a, if I'm a good Bible reader, I'm going to get in there, I'm going to ask the question, hey, where were they? Hey, what were they doing? Because this is not ancillary. This is not a side, uh, kind of a side uh, story over here. This is, I think, integral to understanding what Jesus was about to present and what Jesus was about to do. Because I think what this uh, is going to introduce to us is there's obstacles for all of us bringing something to the table. Uh, as you sit there where you are, there's places you, you've been, there's things that you've done, uh, and they aren't all negative things. Some of them are really good things. But those things begin to put you in a posture where it actually affects what God may want to do in your life. And I think this is the case that we're going to find our disciples, our apostles in, the 12, the people that were right around the circle of Jesus. So let's answer the question real quick. Where were they? And what had they just done and why is that important? If you back up into the passage in verses one and two, watch what happened when Jesus had called the 12 together and he gave them the power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Three words I just highlighted in here. This is not the central part of the message, but I think it's helpful that what had happened was Jesus had called the 12. That means that God had initiated something uh, in them. God had uh, not just uh, treated them as uh, consumers, but he was about to facilitate them moving through that progression of consumers into contributors. And so what did he do? He he gave them something. What did he give them? The, The power of the spirit. What we sang about this morning, what we testified about this morning, the spirit came upon the disciples and the apostles. And and it wasn't for a feel good moment. It wasn't so that they could, uh, uh, it wasn't so that they could have uh, goosebumps in a moment or shed some tears, though all those things, and we're emotional people and those things are good. But the reason that the spirit had come, the power of the spirit was to give them the authority to actually do something, to not just talk about the kingdom of God, but to actually demonstrate the kingdom of God. What does it look like? Like when God's good creation is restored. Uh, well, it looks like the healing of the sick. It looks like demons being cast out. It looks like pain and suffering, sin and death being uh, pushed to the limits and being knocked down by the power of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus in this moment, this is a pivotal moment in the story because up to this point in Luke's gospel, all we've been really hearing about and it's important is who Jesus is. But remember, there's a turn in Luke 9 because what Jesus is also doing is he is also equipping others. He's calling them. He's giving them something. And then what is he doing? He's sending them out. And they have been out. 
And with all the power and all the glory that God had presented to them, they're out. Where are they doing? Well, uh, they're going, but they're, they're actually going kind of empty handed. They've got the spirit, but they don't have much else. As a matter of fact, he told them, take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, leave that town uh, and shake the dust off of your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and they went from village to village proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Now, that sounds really good. That sounds really cool. But you know what that says to me? And maybe it's just because, um, maybe it's because of my profession. That sounds like work to me, okay? Uh, you know, it sounds great, but it also sounds like work. And so they've been traveling by foot They haven't had any sustenance except what was provided to them as they went and whatever they could count on. They were sleeping wherever they could sleep, you know, as people would extend hospitality, they'd come in their house and here, you can sleep right here. And so, I mean, this is tough. Ministry for them was hard. It wasn't easy. It wasn't just like, hey, get your paycheck and come and we're going to give you all this extra stuff. No, it was labor. And matter of fact, I think what you find in here is by the time you get to the story in Luke chapter 10, I don't know what's going on with my microphone, but what happens is I think that they are physically spent. I think they get to Jesus and they are just physically exhausted. You know, you can get physically exhausted of doing really good things. A lot of times the things that are the most exhausting are the very things that um, are, are really good things. Uh, they take stuff out of you. It requires work. And if you're a contributor, it means work, right? But I don't think it's just that they were physically spent in this moment. What Mark's gospel actually tells us is something that Luke doesn't mention. Uh, Mark's gospel and his telling of this story, his version, includes a segment about a really, a really powerful, important figure in their life and in the life of the early church that had just, um, had just been killed. Matter of fact, he had just been beheaded by Herod. And you might know his name as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. Uh, It was Jesus' cousin. Uh, He was the forerunner for Christ. And Mark includes this into the story uh, and and sandwiches it in here. And I I think it's important because they had just come back from this big, big epic moment where, uh, you know, casting out demons, seeing God do all this awesome stuff. They come back to the story of somebody that they love and hold dear that was close to Christ and they find out that he's lost his life because of his testimony. And I, so I think that means that they weren't just physically spent, they were emotionally spent. I mean, have you ever been that way where you were just really tired and then you get the news that somebody close to you has passed? Or there's been a diagnosis or uh, there's somebody that has let you down. Uh, there's been an emotional stirring or turmoil. And it wasn't just that you were physically tired. It seems like it came in waves. And while you were tired, you just experienced all this great stuff, but you're entering into a moment where you just like emotionally spent. Some of you are like that with caring for your parents, your aging parents. Some of you are, are struggling with a, with a child and uh, just dealing with a, a special need or a circumstance that's going on. Some of you are like this because of the state of your marriage or a state of friendships. You're just emotionally spent. You're physically tired, you're emotionally spent, but then you're also relationally spent. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, some of that emotional pain is tied to relationships, but some of it is just sometimes we're just tired of being around people. Can I get an amen? Anybody? Introverts unite, all right, uh, out here. It's like, okay, I'm peopled out, all right? And so when it comes to faith and comes to community of faith, I mean, I've given myself at the school. I've given myself at work. I've given myself. I, I mean, I'm just tired of people. I need some alone time, and you do, okay? You do. You need some alone time. As a matter of fact, the situation that we find the disciples and Jesus in, they are physically spent, they are emotionally spent, and they have been around people nonstop. And so we're told this story. Matter of fact, Mark's gospel, once again, real quick, he actually mentions that very thing. He says, then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. They were so peopled out, they didn't even have a chance to take care of their own needs. They're hungry. They're tired. I mean, honestly, 
They're just exhausted. And so again, in Mark's telling, what does Jesus say to them? And this is gonna segue and drop us back into Luke's gospel, the same story, but Jesus says to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Jesus pulls them away and he says, I want you to spend time with me. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a little commercial break here or a, a little mini sermonette within the middle of this is because I think this is important to set up the rest of it. Uh, it it's what, uh, what I, I heard Priscilla Shire describe uh, with this passage once. And she talked about the fact of when you're tired, everything in you wants to pull away from faith. You wanna pull away from God. You want to just be by yourself. But here's the thing, what does Jesus say when you're physically, emotionally, and relationally spent? He says, come with me. You know what? Intimacy is the answer for your exhaustion. The thing we're tempted to do is to push Jesus and spiritual things aside when we're, when we're spent, when we're exhausted. And what does Jesus say? He says, yeah, go away, get some rest, yes, but take me with you, come with me. Can I get a different microphone? Because that's really like messing me up in my mind. Um, if y'all speak for a living, you know what I mean. It's just kind of like messes my mind up. Um, he's saying, come away with me, be with me, spend time with me. And that's oftentimes the last thing that we do when we're really tired. Pause button. We're going to get a microphone real quick. Oh, I thought you had one in your hand. Never mind. Okay. Yeah, he's getting one. Okay, there we go. Cool. All right. Yeah, now I can sing. I feel like I'm a singer. So, no, everybody said, no, that's not your gift. Don't bring that to the table. <laughs> All right, um, and so what does Luke say about this? Luke takes this idea, and he sets up this beautiful story about the feeding of the 5,000, and here's how it begins. Here's how we transition back into the setting. He took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida, but the crowds learned about it, and they followed him. So who are they trying to get away from? Everybody. <laughs> They're trying to get away from everybody. Uh, they're trying to just be with Jesus, get some rest, emotionally spent, physically spent, relationally spent. And they, they're going away to the solitary place, but they're not going alone. The people are pursuing them. The needs are pursuing them. And so the question becomes, if you don't glance down in your reading, what, do you, what is your reaction to that? Let's just kind of sit in that moment for a second. What is your reaction when you're physically, emotionally, and relationally spent and you've got a group of people that are pursuing you because they need something from you, want something from you. Well, quite honestly, I think the normal human reaction is to say, oh my goodness, I just need some time alone. I just need a break. I've spent my time. Look at all the good stuff I've done in the past. Maybe you say, now it's somebody else's turn. I, I, I've done my time, if you will. Find somebody else to do it. But the question becomes, how does Jesus respond? Not just how we would normally respond, but what does Jesus do? This is what Jesus does. Jesus responds this way in verse 11. Go on to the next slide. He welcomed them and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And he healed those who needed healing. What did Jesus do with the needs? You know, can I just say this real quick, that Jesus was human? Jesus experienced the fullness of humanity. Yeah, he was God. But he experienced what it was like to be tired, to be hurt, to need time alone. I mean, you see Jesus do this all the time, spending time away. I think it's probably what sustained him. You know, he, he would go away to a solitary place by himself and spend time with the Father in prayer and so he felt all these things. But what did he do in this moment when he had given and he had given and he had given and people were pursuing him? He welcomed them. This is supernatural power. Sometimes supernatural power doesn't look like uh, something on the surface that everybody can see. Sometimes it's an internal decision. Supernatural power doesn't necessarily look like the room is full. Supernatural power looks like when I'm tired, when I see a need, I lean into the need and I welcome the people that are in need. I don't draw away. I don't turn a deaf ear. 
I don't keep to myself. I pour my life out. And it's the reason we gather. I mean, the reason that we gather here today is simply because we have a God through Jesus who didn't have to but did anyway. He didn't owe us anything. We didn't deserve anything. And what did he do? He poured his life out to the full. He was in anguish. And then finally he said those three words, it is finished. He did the work. And the reason he did the work is because he welcomed you and he welcomed me because we were pursuing him. We had a need, right? And so during this situation, Jesus is pouring out. But we have, it seems like the way that Luke tells the story, that the, the disciples are in the backdrop. Well, we're not told how they respond yet. It's almost like Jesus is doing this and they're off waiting in the wings. They're kind of watching this whole scenario take place. And I would have to imagine this is me embellishing or impressing on the text, but you know, they're human too. And I, I, I've been human long enough and been around enough of humans to know how we react. And we'd be like, okay, 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 this is good. You know, you're putting on a face. I'm really excited to see all this stuff happen, but inside you're having a different conversation. And then maybe you're not just having an internal conversation. Maybe of the 12, there's a few of you that got off to the side and say, hey, how can we get him out of here? How can we get out of here? And the day is moving along. Five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, two hours. And now it is late in the afternoon. And they finally, they've had enough of all this proclaiming the kingdom of God and all this healing and stuff. And they, 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 they've enjoyed it and it's been good. And, but now they've picked their moment and they said, okay, well, maybe now's the moment where we can say, it's getting a little late, Jesus. Can we, can we do something else? And that's exactly what they do. In verse 12, late in the afternoon, the 12 came to him and said, send the crowd away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place. <laughs> It's a logical conclusion. What is their decision to do with the people that Jesus welcomed? They want to send away the very people that Jesus is welcoming. Now, I want you to put a pin in that for just a second and ask the question, how many times has the church done that? How many times has the church, how much time have we want to send away the very people that Jesus wants to welcome in? I mean, I think there's a sermon series there. There's about 20,000 books that we, sh we should write on this is because Jesus, out of his fatigue and exhaustion, is welcoming people. In, in our broken, sinful flesh, what do we want to do? We want to send away the people that are in the greatest need of Jesus' power. And in order to be the community of faith that God has designed us to be, God wants to shift our thinking. He wants to transform us into the image of Christ where we actually look at the people that are struggling the most, the people that are different from us, the people that maybe we wouldn't necessarily hang out with on a normal Saturday, and God wants us to open wide the door and say, hey, maybe we need to initiate some new relationships. Maybe we need to spend some time, and maybe we need to change our posture of our mind and our heart toward the very people that are pursuing Jesus right now, and maybe they don't even know or testify to the fact of who he really is. They just need his power. They need his healing. They need his gift in their life. And so what does Jesus say to their question, hey, or their statement, send them away? Jesus simply replies this. He says, you give them something to eat. What? I mean, they're looking around. They're trying to figure out what this means. They had a plan, you know, and, and they, they probably had already imagined it. Once we send them away, we can get some rest. We can relax. But Jesus says, I'm here to create a table. And on that particular day, it was the job of the disciples in their fatigue, their exhaustion to serve the table. Now, Think about this for a second. They had just been proclaiming the gospel. They had been casting out demons. And now what is Jesus telling them to do? Don't miss this. What is Jesus telling them to do? He's telling them to simply serve food. This is not a platform. This is not a stage. This is not an audience. This is a group of hungry people that need food. And he takes the very people that he's been positioning and shaping 
and forming into the leaders of the church. And what does he tell them to do? Give them something to eat. Serve them. And this is the posture of what it means to move from a consumer to a contributor, to be challenged through your own weakness, your own misconceptions, your own selfishness that we all have, to move to a point where God is looking to you and to me, is he not? And he's saying, you give them something to eat. Well, like good humans, they give a response. And basically what they do is they give a, a list of excuses. Their first excuse is verse 13. It says, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all this crowd, about 5,000 men were there. So uh, Luke tells us in this little parenthetical section that there's 5,000 men. So uh, most estimates are probably somewhere between 12,000 to 15,000 individuals on the hillside. So uh, this, is, this is a big crowd, right? Um, and you've got how many guys? 12 guys here, um, the, the apostles that were there in the inner circle. And what does he tell them to do? Look at this sea of people, and I want you to give them something to eat. And the first thing they did is what we always do. What do we have? That's actually not what they asked, though. What they said is, what do we not have? They did the math real quick because this is easy math. I'm not, I'm, I don't know trig and calculus, but I can do this math. Right? If I've got five and two and I've got 15,000, something does not add up. This is, this, this is not balanced, the equation, right? And so what does Jesus say? Jesus responds to them. He says, hey, you know, I want you to feed them. Their response is, well, look, we don't have what we need to feed them. Uh, Mark actually adds this in. I'm kind of going back and forth between these two accounts, but Mark adds this in. And he says to them, that would take, they said to him, take more, this would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? This is that person that's always in, in the crowd that says, I don't know, that seems a little wasteful to me. They should go ahead and go buy their own food. Uh, that, are we really supposed to take half a year's wages and spend it on them just for food for an afternoon? I mean, this is a logical question. First they say, well, we don't have enough. And then their mind goes to, how much is it going to cost? We don't have it. We'd have to go buy it. In order to buy it, we'd have to spend all this money. That just seems really wasteful, Jesus. But watch what Jesus says back in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 9. He says to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so. And everyone sat down, taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven he gave thanks and he broke them. Now get out of your spiritual mind for a second. You're in the scene. I know you've just seen a bunch of stuff if you're the disciples, but let's just be honest. Like you're sitting here in this moment and you've got five and two. And Jesus' response to your questions and your excuses is simply he takes what you have and he begins to pray over it. He begins to break it. I mean, I think the normal response, once again, is to say, what in the world are you doing? I mean, really? Like that, that's your response, Jesus. He prays over it. He blesses it. And he breaks it. This is going to come back around later uh, at the Last Supper. This is something that they had seen Jesus do over and over and over again. Break and bless. Break and bless. And so what did he do? He breaks it, he blesses it, and then he gives it to the disciples. He thanks God for it, going to the next slide, and he gave it to the disciples to distribute to the people. Can I just say that God's blessing, for some reason, God chooses to distribute his blessing that he's responsible for through the hands of common people. What God does among us most frequently doesn't happen through some supernatural thing that just drops down from heaven. It passes through the hands of somebody. It, it answers that question that people say, hey, what can I bring? It, Jesus takes what he has. And here's the thing is whatever we have in the hands of a blessed and broken Jesus is enough for what he's calling us to do. But he chooses 
to use people to do what he could do in a moment. He chooses to use people, awkward, inadequate people, excuse-driven people, and he chooses to use those to distribute his blessing to others. Can I just ask you a quick question? What is Jesus passing through your hands? What is Jesus giving you to distribute to someone else? What you would typically take to consume for yourself, what is Jesus instead saying, I want you to take this, and I, what I really want you to do is I want it to pass through your hand. What happens with your finances? What happens with your time? What happens with your resources? Is community of faith, is the Christian faith, if you want to call it that, your relationship with God, is it all about consumption or is it about contribution? God is wanting to give you and has already given you things to distribute that he's broken and blessed. And now he's wanting to send it out through your hands to someone else. And when he does that, God is always responsible for the results. I think another excuse I always have is, uh, what if I'm not enough? What if I'm inadequate? Which is all the time. That's my go-to is like, I don't know if I can do that. I don't, I, I don't know if I have what it takes to do that. And maybe that's yours too. Uh, I look at finances sometimes and I'm like, we don't have the money to do that. And, you know, I, I'm in this battle of faith of, of trying to follow God, even when it's hard and trust him that he's going to provide in all those situations. But the other thing is, is like, I think oftentimes when I have to work for Jesus, that the results are up to me. How hard can I work? What can I prove? But here's the thing, when Jesus distributes something through his people, he's also responsible for the results. And the, responsible, the res results he's responsible for turn out the way he designed them to turn out. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Uh, I think it's telling, isn't it, that what, uh, what was left over after all that was a basket for each of them to take home. You know, like think about that for a second. Don't forget they were hungry. Don't forget they were tired. It wasn't just God proving that he was enough. He was also enough for them. That God was going to feed them too. And a lot of times we think that we're so, we give so much of ourselves that we're not going to be taken care of by God. And what Jesus says is, I see you too. Not only do I see their need, I see your need. And I want to tell you this is because sometimes the church has used so many of you. You feel so used by the church. You feel so beat up by the church. I want you to know that that is not the way of Jesus. That's not the way Jesus designed it. Jesus designed it so that while you are caring for others, God will care for you. He wants to feed you too. And so if you're burnt out, if you're exhausted, know this, that intimacy is the cure for it. And God, in the middle of your anguish, in the middle of your work, he is there for you too. And it, I think it's beautiful because what he does is he equips us, he empowers us, and he sustains us to do what he's called us to do. And that's how we move from church as a restaurant to church as a potluck. Final thing, Paul uh, picked up on this theme a lot. One of my favorite places is just a little quick hit from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. And he was instructing the church at Corinth, and he said this. He said, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. And there are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one is the same God at work. If everyone has a seat at the table, that means everyone has a gift. Everyone has something to bring. And, and my question for you right now is, are you willing to bring it? Everyone has something to bring to the table. And we've got to become a church that embraces the fact that it's not just a few, it's just not just a certain group, that everyone has something to bring to the table. We, we need to move as individuals and as a congregation within our society, not just for us, but 
we need to move into a posture that says you feed them. There's a lot of things, I just really practically speaking, that coming out of COVID that we've been trying to do and the Lord's been correcting us and changing us and it's been, man, it's been, it's been an interesting ride to say the least, you know. We've been trying to search him and try to get back to the core of what he wants us to be and to do. And, and, and we, we've said this a few times um, because sometimes, I, I mean, I'll just be honest, we're tr- really transparent for a second. I mean, people say, well, why aren't y'all doing this or why don't you do this? I'm like, well, we've got to have people to do that. Like, we, we can't just do that. Like, that doesn't just happen. I mean, anything that happens passed through the hands of somebody. And so if nobody brings anything, it's like that potluck you show up to, and all you were going to do is eat Miss Patsy's banana pudding, and you weren't going to bring your own fried chicken. And if Miss Patsy doesn't bring her banana pudding, and you don't bring the fried chicken, well, everybody, nobody eats. Nobody eats. And so the church, the community of faith has got to recapture this is that men and women, young and old, are gifted by God to bring something to the table. And here's the other thing that that tells us is that what you bring makes us better. What you bring makes us better. And you're like, I don't even know what what I have to bring. Well, I think the start is a willingness to come to the table and saying, hey, how can you use me? Trying things out. And this is just one stop. We've got several messages to go about how we relate to those that are not even inside the church. I'm just talking about the family gathering today. But it, you make us better. And we will only become what God has designed us to be if we do that together. And what does it mean? It just simply means you bring yourself. Take that card out that you wrote your name on for a second. If you take that card out and you look at that, that's your name. That's you. You are God's gift to the us that's here. You might not have ever seen yourself that way, thought of yourself that way, but you are a gift to us. And you're a gift to God. God has gifted you with his spirit and his power if you follow him. He, he's gifted you with unique talents and ways of seeing things that somebody else next to you or across the way or I don't have. And God choose to put you here at this moment in this time to do something great, to pass something through your hands and my hands for just a moment, a split second, a vapor. And he asks us to capture the moment even when we're tired even when we're exhausted, spent, and to put ourselves on the table. So here I am to serve. I've got something to bring. There's some really practical ways, to be honest with you, that we need you right now. If, you, if you're not serving anywhere, right outside in the foyer, there's a wall right over there that... Uh, is our go further area. And uh, you'll see it when you go out there. there. There's several needs we have. With this new change, we, we've got some slots that we need to fill in leadership. We need some volunteers to step up and to serve the table. In the area of our kids, area of worship, we need some people that will help and alleviate some of the pressure that's been happening here with our guest services team and uh, production and all those things. And there's different ways that you can do that. Some of them are a once a month thing. Some of them are an every week thing. But before you say no, think about who God wants to welcome. He wants to break it and bless it. And he wants to set it in your hands and say, will you distribute it? And so what you can do if you're in the room is you could simply take what you wrote on there. You could take that card that has your name on it. What I'm gonna ask you to do when you leave here, if you're in the building, is to go straight out there and just pin it on an area of service that you're willing to have a discussion at. There's going to be a couple of people out there that will help you and, and get some information so that we can follow up and figure out what fits for you and all that kind of stuff with your schedule and your time, and your gifts and your talents and your abilities. But this is the next step into the next season where we all come to the table and bring what we have. And what we first all have is we have ourselves. We have ourselves. Some of you are already doing that. I want to say thank you so much for serving the table so faithfully for so long. 
Um, you can go pin your name up out there too. There's a couple of wires out there. Just pin your name on there and say, I'm here. I'm serving. Just drop the area you're serving in if you're part uh, of the family here. Some of you are traveling through. You're passing through. And you're like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my card. Just take your card with you. It's okay. Uh, but take it with you and realize the gift that you are to the church, to others. And God wants to use you in a powerful way. Now, if you're not in the room with us today, uh, you're online. You can also, there's two things you could do. You can go to journeyjonesboro.com slash serve. There's a little form on there. You can quick fill out, link on there, and uh, you can just let us know you're available, and we can follow up with you and have a discussion about what the opportunities are. And then the last thing is next Sunday, if you have not taken the step yet, to officially become a part of the family and say, I, how can I become a part of uh, an active part of this? I want to invite you to join me for Journey Basics next Sunday at 5.30 p.m. right here. We're going to serve dinner. There's child care available. But for many of you, that's the next step in front of you. College students, you're here in Jonesboro. Take the step. Some of you are young couples. Some of you are senior adults. It doesn't matter. We want you to be a part to serve the table together. But it begins with surrender. It begins with giving ourselves to Jesus and to others. And I want to pray over us right now that God would give us that kind of mindset when we look at others around us. Father, we thank you today that you love us enough to spend your life for us. And not just us only, but for others. Lord, our, uh, our propensity is to come only as consumers. And by your grace, we can all be that. We're all in need of you. There's nothing we can bring to you. But because of your grace, you also transform us. You place your spirit in us. You equip us and you gift us to distribute your broken blessing to others. And so, Lord, I pray that you give us that kind of posture of humility. From the front to the back, to the young, to the old. Lord, give us all that kind of posture to those around us. We want to recapture something real. The world is so full of things that are here today and gone tomorrow. But you last forever. And we want to seize this moment. We want to welcome those that you want to heal, the ones that you want to proclaim the kingdom of God is here. So, Lord, we give to you ourselves. We surrender to you, Lord Jesus, all that we have. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.